The Nigerian Senate has passed a bill to empower lawmakers at the national and state assemblies to summon the country's president and the state governors on issues bothering on security and other issues on which they have powers to make laws. Out of a total of 93 registered senators, 77 voted in favor of the bill to summon the president and governors. 13 were against and one lawmaker abstained. It, it also passed a bill to make it an offense to, uh, and to provide the possible conviction of any person who refuses to honor the summons of the National Assembly or any of its committee. Well, joining us to discuss this is uh, Dr. Monday Ubani. He is a legal practitioner. Thank you very much, Doctor, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Yes. Um, to the average mind, um, what exactly is the Senate trying to achieve here? I mean, I know of instances where police chiefs, where heads of departments and agencies or federal power states were invited and they didn't show up. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm yet to understand what they're trying to achieve with governors and presidents coming to answer, especially on issues of security. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to talk whether we can actually put everything into the Constitution, you know, which is what actually has happened here. But if you recall, uh, sometime last year, there was a time that the Senate wanted the president uh, to come so that they can discuss about the security situation uh, that was deteriorating every day. And the president made a promise that he will honor the House. But eventually, according to the same president, he was advised by his attorney general not to honor that invitation. And of course, a lot of uh, uh, anger. And it sparked a lot of up, uh, a lot of discussion in the in the social media and the, the uh, normal media, and uh, I think that that is what has actually uh, reflected by this amendment that has been done, in order to have it in the constitution, that at any point in time, over any matter that the the, the legislators have uh, competence, legislative competence, they have a right to invite the governor at the state level, and they have a right to invite the president at the national level. Mm -hmm. they, they are trying to make it now a constitutional issue so that nobody will be in doubt as to whether they have a power to invite the president over a matter they have legislative competence. That's why they have done it in the constitution. But of course, some of us also have this, uh, you know, belief that it's not everything you put it into the constitution. But you have to put certain things into the constitution when you have a country that doesn't uh, operate normally. We are things that are supposed to be normal are not normal. Maybe you have to now become more detailed to avoid a situation where uh, people will begin to argue that uh, it is constitutional or it's not constitutional to do certain things. I think that is actually what has happened in the present circumstance by putting it into the constitution. But I don't think that any country in the world has such a provision in their in their decent because normally the president comes and address the legislative assembly and anytime the president is wanted. By the, by the legislators, they, they usually normally honor such an invitation. But here, it's a different ballgame entirely, and I think that's why they have gone this drama in order to insert it into the Constitution. I know that you're not the president, neither do you work with the presidency, so I'm just going to ask this question, and I'll give you reasons why I'm asking. Now, um, I want to know why it's so difficult for this president, or any president, to show up at the National Assembly to answer questions or brief the National Assembly on issues that are matters arising or in terms of security uh, like we're facing now. I'm asking this because, for example, in the UK you have the Prime Minister's questions and it's every week. So you see a Boris Johnson or whoever, if it was a David Cameron, they would be there answering questions from members yes. of their political parties and even the opposition. Uh, and and it seems very seamless. Uh, does that mean that maybe, uh, or does it seem that maybe our leaders do not want to be questioned or that they do not know what they're doing in the first instance, hence the reason why they don't want to show up? In fact, there are many reasons why uh, such things happen in this part of the world. There is this uh, absolute arrogance in governance. There is absolute, you know, arrogance in governance. You know, where people who are in government feel they don't owe you any responsibility, they cannot account to you, can't even invite them uh, and ask certain questions. You know, and with such an arrogance in government, it will reflect when they have been invited uh, for purposes like this, especially over matters. These people have legislative competence; they have the right to invite the president. And you have just mentioned it. Virtually every day, the Prime Minister of UK interacts with the members of the House. Questions have been asked. Sometimes it's been booed, sometimes it's been called names, sometimes it's been, been abused, and he has to reply in order to really 
show them that he is there to represent the people. He is the president of the people. And so those guys in the legislative assembly are also representatives of the people. And so they ask questions to reflect the wishes and the, 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 the whims and caprices of, their, of those people they represent. And so whatever they ask, the president we must be in a position to give an answer to them. But here is arrogance of power. It is issue of impunity. It's also issue of maybe they don't even understand why they're in governance in the first place. Ignorance may have also impact in the in the in the way we treat each other in this part of the world. And also politics. You know, they may be also afraid that when they go to the house, they may be embarrassed by the by the by the opposition. And then they may not even have something to probably offer by way of explanation. That also account when you don't have anything to say. The only thing you need to do now is to use arrogance to cover it and say you will not appear, you will not even go and answer certain questions. But of course, if you have done well, and you are very confident that you have done so so well and all that, and then the House is inviting you, you shouldn't be afraid to go and give them an answer and probably, you know, give them an explanation of what you are doing in governance. So most times it's also issue of incompetence and you are not doing much and you have not done much. There's nothing you're going there to go and explain that will actually make sense and all that. That's why they keep away. Uh, so his, his incompetence, his lack of uh, giving good governance, uh, is also arrogance, is also impunity, and also lack of accountability. These are all combined facts that makes uh, us to be different from what obtains in other in other developed claim. Let's look at the Houses of Assembly. I mean, as much as we would point fingers at the National Assembly, where these the ruling party seems to have the majority, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, members, um, the state Houses of Assembly are majorly occupied by people also in the party of the governors and half the time the laws that we i don't even know what laws are being made in the states so far or what legislation uh, legislations are happening there uh, but how do we expect to see um, these lawmakers at the state level summon their their governors uh, being that most of them, like you said, to borrow your word, uh, uh, are the whim, uh, whim and ca whims and caprices of these governors. We've seen this happen so many times. I mean, we've, we've even seen um, local governments as an appendage of uh, state governments. So, I mean, whether this, this bill is passed into law or not, what changes will we see? I mean, we've had so many laws that have been broken or flouted. What, what's, what, 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 what difference would this one make? Well, I, 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 it's an intelligent question. It's better we have this legal framework in the in the in the place in the first place. Then we need to actually change our political culture. This issue of subservience, being subservient to a governor, and the governor being unduly interfering with who becomes the speaker of the house and the leadership of the house, so that they become subservient. They don't query the governor and all that. We need to, first of all, deal with the issue of legal framework, which is what is going on now. A time we come where the leadership of the houses, you know, we become very independent enough, just like we had in uh, Saraki's era, where we had Saraki that was questioning the president and all that, you know. Remember that it was like he's in opposition. He was in a different political party, but later he jumped to the other side of, uh, of the political party. So let's have the legal framework, which is what we have actually succeeded in doing now. But let's agree that it will even pass through, sell through in the, in the various states, uh, states of our assembly. Because I know that the governors may not want that uh, autonomy, which is very critical. Legislative autonomy and judicial autonomy, which the Senate and the House of Rep have actually passed. Let it reflect in the two thirds that of the of the 36 states that, that will actually concur before it becomes a, a constitutional provision. So I hope they will be able to do that. At the end of the day, if the houses will begin to have legal uh, independence. In terms of uh, financial autonomy and administrative autonomy, we, we may have to come to a time where they will begin to summon the governors and summon the, the president, you know, and ask questions. And if they refuse, they may likely take some level of uh, action like impeachment of the governor and all that. But the legal framework is the first thing for. And I think that what we should concentrate our mind now is to ensure that all these uh, innovations that actually happen with this passage by the Senate and House of Reps will be replicated by two third uh, of the statistics state. Because if they don't do that, then that means that the whole thing will just collapse again. Mm. We are back to square one. Let, let's look. Let's look at political parties and the role they play in this, in all of this, um, especially for states. And just like you said, um, the governor somewhat has an influence in who, on who's the speaker. Uh, at half the time, you see. Um, speak, pe people who were speakers impeached by other members or votes of no confidence passed on them because 
uh, at the behest of the governor, even though it's not made to look that way, but we know what happens, uh, you know, under, underneath. Now, uh, when it comes to the place of political parties, um, sometimes even um, tickets to rerun for that office sometimes can be taken off of those candidates uh, and they're, they're robbed of, uh, of those tickets because uh, maybe they're, they're in opposition to what the governor wants or what the governor is saying. Um, how do political parties play into this particular legislation? Because we can't also say that this is what will happen in the, in the lower and upper houses without also looking at um, the implications uh, when they go back to the meetings within their political parties. The political parties actually in Nigeria have not developed the level of a political party that is different from those who are in government. Most times the political parties pander to the state executive at the state level, at the federal level to the presidency. Because they lack ideal, they lack ideology. What do political parties in Nigeria represent? What do they stand for? They stand for nothing. And as long as they stand for nothing, they fall for everything. So the president says that they're looking at the president's body language. The same thing with the governor at the state level. And so it is really a big problem for us, you know. So the issue of political culture, of independence, and probably, you know, having an ideology in what they believe in and what they propound, we go a long way. But when a political party has an ideal, every member that follows the ideal is respected and, and, and then upheld. And then you can, you can be sure of coming back to the house even when you work against uh, the interest of the party, believing that you are, they respect your ideal, they respect your belief. But here, somebody like Sheh Usani, remember, because of certain things he did and re revealed in the house, that was why they made sure that he never came back. And all that. So the political parties here are complicit. You know, they, they, they aid and abate some of the wrong things that is going on in Nigeria. They don't have any ideal. And as long as they don't have any ideal, they fall for everything. And that's where we're, we're, gonna, we're still having problems you know, in terms of developing a political culture that actually works in the interest of the people and interest of the country. We don't have a political party that has actually matured in a manner that we have other, you know, political parties in developed, you know, climb, where we see what they believe in an ideal and people pursue that ideal. We don't, we are over here. It's the fall for everything. The governor controls, delivers some power at the state level. At the federal level, it is the, the president that does that, you know, irrespective of whatever they, they believe is their ideal and ideology. Well, I want to say, um, whatever happens, uh, you know, it remains to be seen because in this conversation, it looks like no matter where we look, no matter how we look at it from whatever angle, it looks like um, it still boils down to whatever decisions the governors and Mr. President make at the end of the day. But I want to say thank you, Dr. Mondo Bani, for speaking with us on this matter. We'll keep our fingers crossed and we'll see how this legislation um, unfold. Thank you very much for having me. Good night. All right. Thank you all for staying with us as we round off the conversation on the show tonight. In today's Street Views, um, Nigerians are speaking out on how the fuel crisis is affecting them. I'm sure it's affecting you too. But I'll leave you with this as I come back tomorrow with Plus Politics. I am Mary Anacle. Do have a good evening. It's around that, uh, 15 minutes after 8. I'm, I'm here to buy fuel. We are queued for other palace there down to turn to other the, under the bridge, come back to the mobile. The, if they say small, they will stop. First of all, I even went there to say what was going on. As I missed them as an officer, as a last man, they said I should ask Nigeria they do. I said, who should in Nigeria they do? They said I should give them one, they will pass me enter. I said, like, I'm on. They said, okay, I should give them one five. I said, for what? It's very bad. Very, it's very worse. bad. As you can see, we. I'm opposite my office here, National Open University. I was here in the morning. I didn't even go into my office. I had to queue to buy fuel and see where I am. I'm not even sure whether I'm going to get fuel. Uh, I've been here since 9 a.m. and this is actually getting terrible. We actually started our queue from the other side of the road. We have to go turn under the bridge, then make it down here. So since 9 o'clock, we check the time now, this past three. That means I've been here for over six hours just because I want to get to fuel. I think it got bad over the weekend. Uh, it wasn't like this last week. But uh, possibly, my opinion, maybe the good fuel that we have, available prior to the foul fuel that they brought, we are possibly exhausted down. And uh, once 
it gets exhausted, of course, there will be scarcity. Knowing fully well that uh, the war in Russia, Ukraine, they said, has disturbed distribution.